Publish Her Podcast, episode 99. Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of the Publish Her Podcast. Today we're talking all things children's books, really digging into looking at social emotional learning, different uh, elements and themes in children's books, and the difference between self publishing and traditionally publishing books. So, we dig into a lot of different things on this topic, but this one's for you if you have written, are writing, or are thinking about writing a children's book. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Publish Her Podcast, a place where you can come to get inspiration, motivation, help, encouragement, and support in your journey to write, publish, and sell your book. Hosted by Alexa Bigwarf. Because I've been where you've been, and I felt what you're feeling. Welcome to another episode of the Publish Her Podcast. I'm Alexa Bigwarf, your host, and today we're going to talk to a children's book author, which I'm very excited for our children's book authors in our community because we haven't done this in quite a while, and um, it's always good to add diversity for our entire audience, so I would like to welcome Cheryl Bass to the conversation today. Cheryl Bass holds a master's degree in social work and has studied child development. She uses these insights to inform her picture book writing. She holds a master's degree in journalism and is currently working in public relations. Her goal in creating Be Kind Publishing is to produce lighthearted rhyming stories with gentle themes of teamwork and friendship. She resides just outside of Chicago, Illinois with her husband and two terriers. Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I am happy to talk about this because while well, you write around um, the topic of social emotional learning or SEL, and I think this is uh, like a topic that's really important for children's book authors right now. I mean, we're seeing a time um, where this topic is becoming more discussed, where people are using it more in schools, where parents are becoming a- aware of what this is. Whereas when I was uh, raising mine, who are now teenagers, we didn't really talk about this very much. So first of all, can you tell us what social emotional learning is and why it's important to teach it to children, specifically through children's books? Sure. Well, um, social emotional learning, as far as I know, it's a term that's recently um, gained popularity in um, children's education and now also in children's books. Um, I am not in the education space, so I'm just going to try to answer it from my knowledge base as a former social worker um, and a children's book writer. Basically, from my understanding, at least for this age group, social emotional learning basically um, are those uh, soft skills that report that uh, employers basically look for um, in adults when they're hiring. Um, you know, can you share? Do you work well with others? Um, do you have a sense of teamwork? Do you have accountability? Will you apologize if you do something wrong? Those are the kind of things. Do you share? You know, um, that type of thing. And you learn those skills early or you don't. Um, you know, and unfortunately, the last few years, Um, a lot of kids are behind because the give and take that you get in the classroom, a lot of kids haven't had that. So say a kid is seven years old in the last three years, he's been at home in the pandemic. um, He hasn't gotten that type of informal um, education. So books like these that give these types of messages can be even more important than they ever were before. It's funny, as you were saying that, I was thinking to myself, um, okay, so maybe we did talk about it. We just called it something different. I remember a meme that was going around for a long time with everything I need to know in life. I learned in kindergarten, Mm -hmm. how to share, how to hug, how to be nice, how to do, I'm not allowed to hug anymore. I don't know. (laughs) Fist pump. Right, fist bump, how to do those things. That's so, 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 but it's nice that it's being incorporated into children's books because, I mean, obviously, as a children's book writer and me as a children's book publisher and a mom, like I know how valuable those story times are and how much they really do teach children different pieces of life. So I think it's, it's critically important. Um, when you, so you write with your Be Kind Publishing. Um, I'm uh, with themes of teamwork and friendship. I just really love. How did you get started in this, especially with a background in journalism and public relations? What made you decide I'm going to write children's books on these topics? Well, before I did journalism and um, 
and public relations. I, in my previous life, I was a social worker. Wow. So, um, and in my social work schooling, like you had said, I, I studied um, child development. This book actually, throughout my life, I've always written personal essays and um, I've written a lot of poems. Growing up, my sister and I, uh, we both sing and um, we used to change the lyrics to songs. And um, that was, those were always our gifts to our parents. So we would sing and harmonize and change the lyrics to songs to be about someone's birthday or an anniversary or whatever, like spoof uh, parodies. Um, but this book came about because one day I was walking along and I sneezed and it was a really big sneeze. And I had the ridiculous thought, oh, well, it's a good thing that I wasn't a dragon because if I were a dragon, this would do a lot of damage. And I thought, <laughs> wow, well, that sounds like a children's book idea. <laughs> So I wrote it and a first draft and I kind of left it alone for a while. This was 13 years ago. And then about a year ago, I tried um, really contacting um, literary agents and book publishers and nobody was interested. Nothing was happening. And um, I've learned since then that it's very hard, particularly with um, children's picture books. Yeah. It's very competitive. Yes. You know, say an imprint has room for maybe 10 children's picture books in a year. You know, well, Jimmy Fallon and Mariah Carey and Reese Witherspoon and Shaw, uh, I think his name is Sean something rather. Anyway, a lot of these late night TV people um, and, and other celebrities have all written children's picture books. So, of course, if you're a publishing house, you're going to want to give that space to somebody who already has the name recognition. They've already got an audience um, that will definitely purchase that book. It's more of a risk to go with somebody who is an unknown, yeah. but I feel like self-publishing has really leveled the playing field for regular folks to get out there. If they've got a story in them that they want told. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what brought me to self-publishing. Well, and, and you were telling me a little bit in, uh, before we started recording about your editors, do you want to talk yes. for those? Because I know we have children's book authors and and what I'd like to do, since you have this experience going through the self-publishing, and I know many in our audience will go that route, we can talk kind of like about your editors, about um, the production of the book and that, if that's all right with you. Sure, sure. So when I initially was posed the idea of self-publishing a book, I really didn't want to do it because I thought... Um, I was going to have to buy some big, thick book called Self-Publishing for Idiots or similar, and I was going to have to really be on my own, you know, but the term self-publishing is somewhat of a misnomer because there's lots of people and organizations that can help you. So uh, one of the first things I did was I joined SCBWI, the Society yes. of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, yes. Yes. and then Children's Book Insider, CBI, um, and both of those are websites um, where there are um, conferences you can go to. There's webinars you can join online, you know, from your home. Um, there's a, a full library on both of those sites of videos that you can watch that have, uh, you know, that are evergreen. They're always useful. Um, so, uh, and there's contests you can enter um, that where you can win prizes for things that you've written. So there's a lot of resources there. And um, I was looking at uh, one or the other, I forget which one of those, but one of them had a video, I think it was SCBWI, and it was a video about self-publishing, and it was put together, um, it was a woman named April Cox, and she oh, has I a business April. called, yes. you know her? Yes, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's everywhere, <laughs> I mean, she's fantastic, so she has this, uh, this, or this um, business that she started called Self Publishing Made Simple, and um, she basically was my Yoda on this journey. Oh, um, I love it. So, yeah. So basically she would be on Zoom calls with me and she would show me how to upload. She would actually do it for me on the call, uploading my manuscript into the Library of Congress, helping me get my ISBN codes. That's like the UPC type symbol that's on the back of every book um, and how to purchase those and, and that whole process. Um, she walked me through that. And she also has vendors that she works with. Um, so for example, when it was time to find my illustrator, she had 12 illustrators that she regularly works with, that she knows are responsive and will give the writer the rights to those illustrations when they're, they're completed. So you get the full rights to everything. It's yes. work for hire. And so I looked at the websites of all 12 of those illustrators and I picked my top four that I liked the best. And then she said, okay, pick a scene from your book 
and have those four, give them each $50 and have them each sketch in black and white the same scene. And then you can decide um, from that same scene, which which of those four you like the best. Well, then I was able to hone it down to my top two. And then I used my friends and family, especially those with children and grandchildren as a focus group. And I said, which dragon do you like better and why? Which girl do you like better? And um, one of the things that was so great about self-publishing is the creative control that I had. I was able to tell the illustrator what I wanted my dragon to look like you know, I wanted snot hanging down from his nose and I wanted his nose to be red and I wanted his eyes to be, you know, bloodshot and roomy. And so all of that back and forth. And I even sent um, images of people wearing um, old Viking types of clothing, what I wanted my um, townspeople to be wearing, you know, all of that I had control over. Now, if I were traditionally published, because I don't draw myself, I'm not a writer illustrator. If I were to have been traditionally published, the publishing house would have picked the illustrator and the illustrations might not have been my vision at all right. for what I wanted the people or the dragon or anything to to look like. So um, it's been a great process and I definitely want to use the same illustrator, Remish Ram, again. Oh, that's that's good that you had such a great experience. And I'm also glad to hear the shout out for April. I've I've worked with April. She's been um she's been a speaker on the Women in Publishing Summit before. She's part of mm -hmm. our community. And I I have heard great things about her program. So this just mm -hmm. reiterates that. And I'm gonna make sure to include the link in the show notes to her school. Um, she mm -hmm. opens it two or three times a year, I think. So I'll make sure the link's in there so that you know how to get to that. But right. I, I do really think if you're self-publishing, to your point about P using people to help guide you and direct you through it. Um, there's a couple that April Cox and Karen Ferreira of Children's Book Mastery. Um, they they have two of the best programs that I've ever seen for children's book authors. So just speaking to the audience here, use a program like that. It will save you so much time, energy, effort, headache, money, and mm -hmm. all of those things as you have an expert walk you through the process. Um, did we mention, did we get to your editors yet? I can't remember. Oh, okay. So, um, one of the editors, I found another, um, resource that's very helpful is Facebook groups. If yeah. you think you have a disease, there's a Facebook book group for that <laughs> disease. You know, there's, there's Facebook groups for everything. That's one of the few things that's really good about Facebook. Also helping you remember people's birthdays, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I had gone on one of these, um, self-publishing Facebook groups that I joined and I posted a question about editing and somebody responded. Her name was Laura Bonchi, B-O-N-T-J-E. And um, she is a children's book editor, and she was very instrumental in what is called a developmental edit for me. The developmental edit is to find holes in your story. So, for example, in my story, it's about a dragon who um, accidentally sneezes and burns down a village by accident. And they're all ready to attack him um, until they realize uh, through a little girl who advocates for him and, and really takes up his cause, uh, they realize that it was an accident and then they try to help him get better. Um, but she, when she read my first draft, she said, why aren't his parents helping him? Why doesn't, you know, and so then I realized I had to go back and add some sentences about the fact that he hatched alone in this cave. So he doesn't have parents that are involved. So one of the themes in my story is also found family, you know, that your, your friends and loved ones can be your family of choice, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, so, uh, but she found that hole in my story that I never would have thought of you know where are the parents and and why does she why does he need the help of the community if he you know why can't his parents help him um then I also got um help when I was nearly finished from someone named Bobby Hinman and she is an award-winning children's book author and she also she is very her specialty is rhyme and meter so if you write a, a children's picture book in rhyme she will really help you make sure that um that it's that the meter is very consistent can you route. spell her name again? Um, B B. I'm sorry. B O B B I E. Bobby Hinman. H I N M A N. H I N M A N. Okay, great. Meter and rhyme. Awesome. And I'll look up these um, these uh, websites and put them in the show notes for anybody who's listening, so that you have access to that. Because these are really, uh, I think, when it comes to children's book editors, like it's really important to have strong recommendations from somebody who's used them and gone through the process and can validate them as an editor. So that's awesome. And then April, did April help you with the formatting? 
Um, the formatting of what goes on what what page? Yeah, she did some of that, and um, Bobby Hinman um, did the rest of that as well. Bob Bobby does formatting as well. Yes. Wonderful. That's yes. What goes on what page? But that at the very there's also some that is done. Uh, so once you have your illustrations completed, then there's somebody else that's part of April's team that helps with um, what yeah. the what type of font yeah. the the page you know and where exactly the words are going to appear on each page that sort of thing. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so. Um, and then the marketing, the marketing, the marketing, the marketing. And you mentioned to me before we recorded that you actually assist authors in marketing children's books. Let me tell you, as a children's book publisher with Purple Butterfly Press, I don't know that I've ever done anything as hard in my life as marketing a children's book. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would love your tips on this and I'm sure our audience would as well. Um, it's funny. We hear people talk all the time. They're like, cause we talk about through general marketing, through authors, we talk about knowing your ideal audience and getting in front of your ideal audience. And you know, when the, when people say, well, the ideal audience is obviously children, but it's really their parents and teachers and all those people who are buying the books and how do you do that? So if I, I know I didn't prepare you for this question, but if you have some tips on marketing that you You'd like to share off the cuff, I know we would all appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so I work for several different entities as a PR professional, and I've done the PR for my own book just sort of on my own. Um, but one of the entities that I work for is C L A I R E Claire McKinney, M C K I N N E Y PR. She specializes in um in PR for, for books. Um, traditionally published and self-published, not just children's books, but all different types of books. And um, so it's promoting authors. So she is totally in that industry. She knows um, what awards to try out, try for, which ones are sort of a waste of money, which ones are reputable. Um, she knows um, she ha we have databases of the uh, book reviewers um to to go for and those not to um the podcasts that are useful to be on those that are not uh as much as listened to or useful all of those types of things she knows the industry she knows how to package a pitch and a press release and and all of that um to get in front of the reporters and so on the part that i didn't know um, was the paid advertising piece so i'm still learning that you know um what are the magic keywords that right. really do very well. Some of that April was able to help me with. Um, she was able to, for example, plug certain words into um, some kind of something on, on the computer. And she was able to see which words um, seem to uh, sell better. So for empathy, trust, we were trying all kinds of words like that. And we added like a, a subhead to the name of my book, which doesn't appear on the title of my book, but you're allowed to have a subhead in Amazon. So it says something like um, Baby Dragon's Big Sneeze, a children's book about empathy and trust for, for children ages three to seven. Oh, wow. So we threw those words in there because she knew those words sell better. Um, so, um, so definitely, um, I would say one of my first things is um, consider getting a PR professional to help you and a PR professional that specializes in books and authors and that whole industry um, can be very helpful. Um, expect, or, or I think it would be a good idea to expect to pay more than what you've paid for your illustrator for your marketing. Yeah. If you're including PR and you know ads on Amazon, ads on Facebook and so on, um, you know, paying something like NetGalley, which can get you started with getting some reviews mm -hmm. on your book. That can be very important. Another place that's really great for reviews that I'm using weekly is called pubby.co, P-U-B-B-Y.co, not .com, .co. I don't know why it's .co. Maybe .com was taken, but oh, in any case, yes. <laughs> when you go to that website, you can use it free for 10 days or you can pay an annual fee. And the annual fee is, I think, only about $200. And I think it's totally worth it. Basically, what you do is you pay this fee to review other new authors' books and then to get your books reviewed. Now, it's not an exact quid pro quo. So it's not like, um, Alexa, I, I uh, review your book and then you review mine. So right. if I don't give you a good review, you're going to give me a bad review back right. or something. Right. 
I review your book and in turn you review person X's book, you know, so it's not an exact quid pro quo. So when I review other people's books, I, I get a currency on this site called snaps and I can turn in those snaps for reviews of my book from other people. And I, when I'm reviewing other people's books, I can see how many words they are. Mm -hmm. So I can make sure that I review other people's books that are also children's books that have fewer than 1,000 1, words. So I'm not spending a lot of time, but if I review, maybe I can review up to four a week of other people's. And that means four, four other people are reviewing my book. Yeah. Um, so, so that is an additional way to get more reviews that can be very helpful. Um, that's, that's great. I'm I'm actually really pleased to hear you talk about um, this company because I think I always, it, this is a case in point of why um, you should it, try things on your own and see what works for you because you're going to get different re, different uh, feedback from different people about different things. And while I'm ta here talking in circles, let me just explain. I tried pubby.co and I hated it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I only because only because of the process that you just talked about, right? I don't have time to go out and read a whole bunch of other people's books for reviews. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to be able to pay for reviews. I wanted to be able to put it on a site and just get, you know, pay for a certain amount of reviews. So I I'm really happy to hear from your perspective though, because for other authors who are engaged and want to do that, want to go out and read a bunch of other books and want to review them and want to participate in this, like I am not, I, I think it's wonderful that that this is a tool that you use and I'm glad to have that perspective and, and also glad to be able to share about a resource that other people may really enjoy, especially if there's a lot of other children's books authors out there who have the time to do that, want to commit to it and go through that process. Plus, I mean, I, I really believe that the best way to become a better author and to see how you can sell better books is to be in the process of reading a bunch of books and seeing what other people are putting out and seeing what you think is good and bad and all those types of things. So I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I would have never talked about it because I did not love my experience. Um, but I think one of the best parts of being in a community like this is that you can, or in a podcast like this, is that you can hear different perspectives on things and what may not be someone else's cup of tea might be exactly the right thing for a different right. author. So thank you for sharing that resource. Yeah. yeah, for me, I spend a half an hour, 45 minutes a week yeah. reading other people's stuff on Pubby that I should be reading anyway, just to stay abreast of what my competition is, what yeah, other exactly. people are that's doing. That's a great point. And, you know. Oh, and that's also a difference, I think, is that for children's books, it's a thousand words or less. It's manageable. Right. For me, I'm in the fiction and nonfiction thing. And I was like, I can't read 15 books a right. month from all these. I'm reading all my clients' books. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, great, great, uh, great resource. And I'll put the link to that in there too, because I mean, it can be a fun way to interact and to uh, get new reviews and to to participate as well. So you've shared a lot of really great resources and you know, the PR thing, I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's good that you talked about that and it's good that you brought it up and it is, it is a scary investment, but I think in particular, and you can, especially since you work for a PR person, like I think for children's book authors in particular, it's a lot harder to pick up some of the traditional marketing that a fiction or nonfiction author might be doing through sites like um, <clears throat> Goodreads or not necessarily, not across the board, but when we are talking about like what I see with children's authors is that a lot of sales come through school events, come through fairs, come through um, author events, come through um, uh, other places that you're going out and getting in front of the community. And I think for children's books, authors, if you don't know how to go out and find those things or be in, engaged in that process, it's really important that you consider maybe hiring somebody else who has those media contacts, who can get you on the news, on the morning news, where moms uh, hear you talk about your book or teachers hear it or whatever. Um, what, what are your thoughts as a PR expert on that? Yeah, I think that can be very helpful. And I think it's very important um, if you are an introvert to work through that, yes. because um, it, for the greater good of getting your book out there, yes. um, you know, everybody has something that they are um, maybe insecure about or uncomfortable about, about putting themselves out there. Um, I have a little bit of a visual impairment that maybe some people, some viewers can notice as I'm talking here, but 
it's for the greater good of getting my book out there. So I'm, I'm talking on these podcasts and doing this. So, um, so I think that can be very important for people and, and making those connections in your community. Um, in fact, April had a person that um, made an entire database um, and now sells it. And I bought it from him of um, all the libraries, both public and academic in the entire United States. His name is Eric something. I forget his last name, but I found him through April. How to get your, and he has a book, how to get your, your book into libraries. And um, so I bought this database and this weekend I'm going to spend some time. Um, I'm going to craft a letter and about my book and send it to all these librarians throughout the United States and um, see if I can sell, you know, if I sell one copy to each, you know, to several li libraries, that's, that's another resource for me. And a lot of times, and he said he has statistics on this, that people who read books in a library oftentimes will then go and buy the book, yeah. either for themselves or for someone else. So it's not just that it ends there with the librarian. The person may read it and then think, oh, you know, this is a great book for my cousin for their birthday's coming up. I'm going to go buy it, you know? So, um, so that can be a resource too. the libraries. Um, yes. Going into schools, um, doing readings, you know, um, someone even suggested um, bookmarks, getting bookmarks with uh, some of the graphics and so on of your book in the bookmark and handing out the bookmarks to the children at, at a, um, a book event, um, a reading at, at, a, um, at a school or, some, or similar. And then they bring home the bookmark and the parents see the bookmark and then maybe purchase the book. So yeah. all, all kinds of great ideas. The, um, I think the underlying theme here is that to be successful as a children's book author, whatever that success looks like to you, uh, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of knowledge base and there's a lot of steps that have to be taken and there's a lot of people that you can work with. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you have to be really committed to this, whether no matter which route to publishing you're going, you have to be committed to a lot of work, but it can be such a great end result. How many books do you have out now? Um, I just have the first book that I've written so far um, that I published in October of uh, 2022, October 19th. And um, I am working on a sequel. And, and that's something that April told me is that one of the best ways to sell a book is to make a sequel. And then people buy that book, this, make a series, you know, and people, when, once your second book comes out, not only do you sell your second book, but you sell a lot more of the first book because yes. people then want, you know, they, it's cumulative. Yes. So, um, you know, and you already have the characters, you already have the illustrator knowing how to make those characters. So it's, um, it's much easier once you've already introduced those characters to then have them have other adventures, you know, that, and, and so, um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Absolutely. That is wonderful. Well, we can't wait to see. And how are things going with the first book? Great. They're going great. So Good. I have uh, my first book signing coming up in March at a Barnes and Noble. Um, I'm going to be reading it at my church. Um, because they, they, in, in their church service, there's always a section where there's a children's book. That's whatever the theme is that the minister is talking about that week. Uh -huh. They, they also have a children's book reading about oh, that. Fine. So I'm going to be reading that, uh, to the congregation. So, um, so that, that's going to be great too. So there's, and, and book fairs and things like that. Definitely when there's, um, art fairs and things like that in the summer in Chicago area, mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be, you know, rent a booth. And be there and and sell my books. I've heard from a lot of people that you can actually make more sales sometimes at things like that than you can um, through something like Amazon. You know, when oh, you're yes. just there, you're there in person, you're you're shaking people's hands and you're meeting them, um, and they're local and you're local. Um, that can and the royalties are higher with that too, because 100%. when you do it through Amazon, it's it's not as much. Yeah, I I actually I met a woman at the. Um, at the um, IBPA Publishing University Conference in March. And she told me that she sells 10,000 copies a year just at events. Mm. Just at events. I'd like to say it, sell 10,000 copies total of many mm. of the books, but just at events is, is incredible. And to your point, yes, if you order copies of the book and go, you know, you're not sharing any royalties or getting, you know, anything from... From the big company run by Jeff B. Um, but yes, well, this has been, where can people find your books? Oh, and I don't think we ever dis discussed the title. Please tell us the title and a full author name so people can go look for it. Sure. It's called Baby Dragon's Big Sneeze. And like I said, it's about a baby dragon who sneezes, burns down a village. Um, <laughs> and he's horrified by what he's done. 
um, and a little girl, uh, everyone else is ready to attack him, but it's a little girl who goes to his cave because it doesn't make sense to her. He's been getting along fine, just um, soaring above them for, for weeks. Why would he suddenly attack them? So even though she's mad that he burned down their whole village, she decides to see, get his side of the story. And um, good thing she does because she becomes the heroine of the story. She saves him. She saves the villagers. It saves the day, basically. She's the hero um, by, by not making assumptions about someone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's available on Amazon.com and all the other Amazons in other countries. It's available in BarnesandNoble.com, uh, Walmart.com, and Target.com. That is wonderful. Well, I'm, that sounds like a very cute story. I have a three-year-old niece. I think I'll be checking that book out for her. Um, but that that's really great. I, You know what? I appreciate all the tips that you brought for our children's book authors. And even for me as a publisher, I'm taking it in and learning the things too. We can never really stop learning in this industry, can we? I mean, you have brought up some places and some people that, and some organizations that I wasn't aware of yet. So I'm excited to look into this children's book insight program that was new to me. Mm. And um, I'll have all these links and all these references in the show notes. So be sure to go over to our website to grab those. Um, but thank you for taking the time to be here and, and bringing all of this knowledge. This was a really fantastic um, knowledge dump. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, well, thank you so much for having me. You don't have to give me your heart. You don't have to give it away. You don't thank you for joining us on the Publisher Podcast. We hope to see you back for the next episode. Great, huge thanks goes to Jasmine Commerce for the use of her song. You can find Jasmine on SoundCloud. Go check out all of her music. We'll see you next time. <laughs>